Okay, today we discuss the uh, somewhat pagan, if you go with that concept of an idea, origins of Easter. Easter is that funny little holiday that we have where we have eggs and things like that and Easter bunnies and it all goes also with Passover and Christianity and things which have somewhat adopted it and people I believe have agreed upon that. What we're looking at here is a depiction of the goddess Ishtar or Inanna or you might know her as Diana or Venus. And this is a depiction showing you somewhat a symbology of it all. You notice that she's surrounded by wood and that she's wearing uh, some henna tattoos, which is somewhat symbolic also, and tattoos through all the Proto-Indo-Europeans that used to carry this heritage that we're talking about today. And in her you can see dried flowers pine cones and a bunch of nuts and things too that are here and that's a symbolic of an egg of life a concept of being able to keep the eggs of life through the winter to make it through a harsh winter to have the things that it takes to make it quite often during this symbology too one eye is closed her hair could be draped down before her face. Quite often she is seen in lipstick and vibrant. What one would say a come hither type look or a sexy type of look. And Nana was quite often shown with these type of depictions and so are so many effigies that go back into ancient, ancient primordial times, even times before what we're going to speak of today. For it comes from a time earlier than we even speak of, and I'll hint back to it as we go. But this was a spring goddess. Her counterpart is the green man, who would have been Bacchus, as most of people know him as. But let's look into this a little bit. Um, the ancient pagan origins of Easter. Easter is a festival and a holiday celebrated by millions of people around the world who honor the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Described in the New Testament as having occurred three days after his crucifixion at Calvary, and three days is symbolic, it is also the day that children excitedly wait for the Easter Bunny to arrive and deliver their treats of chocolate eggs. And so it's always got to do with candy and things like that too. And that's another symbology of being able to make it through in a land of milk and honey and what you would eat and things and perhaps nuts and honey and things helped a lot through they were a non-perishable food that could be helped to keep you in a healthy state through harsh winters back whenever it used to be extremely more difficult than going to your local store Easter is a movable feast which is strange and unique. Generally, people have pegged them down to certain days, but this holds a heritage attached to the moon. This movable, movable feast, which is chosen to correspond with the first Sunday following the full moon after the March equinox, and occurs on different dates around the world since Western churches use the Gregorian calendar, while Eastern churches use Julian-type calendar. Here we have a depiction of Christ showing himself after the uh, resurrection. And most historians, including biblical scholars, agree that Easter was originally a pagan festival. According to the New Unger's Biblical Dictionary, the word Easter is of Saxon origins. Estra, the goddess of spring, who also honors sacrifices, were offered about Passover each time of year. Now, Estra has a lot to do with estrogen and femininity. By the 8th century, Anglo-Saxon had adopted the name to designate the celebration of Christ's resurrection. However, among those who maintain that Easter has pagan roots, there is some disagreement over which pagan tradition the festival emerged from. Here we'll explore some of those perspectives. And I'm telling you now before we begin, they are all connected 
to the ancient Proto-Europeans that spawned these all, and it's why they all have this edict and idea in keeping with it, and it has to do with farming and seasons and a time, and people watching the stars and knowing how it all works out. Keep stories like this, and it's kept sacred because it means so much to so many things. The animals and the deers have kids, and well, we eat those, and all these things go together with things. And you want to time your children and all this type of stuff if you can. Of course, not always, but uh, anyhow, resurrection is a symbol of rebirth. One theory has been put forward that Easter story of crucifixion and resurrection is symbolic of rebirth and renewal and retells the cycle of the seasons, the death and return of the sun. And I'm telling you that it originally was the concept of Christmas. And they've changed it to Easter for a reason I'll explain to you here. The ancient Sumerians, who uh, pretty much developed most, literally most of what we have today, uh, writing, agricultural methods, irrigation, and so on, and took them to a higher level from Proto-Indo-European roots, they were declamated to making their numerating system on sixes and sixties, which contains ten because of that, but on sixes and sixties, and it had a special reason for that, and I won't go into all of this, but in doing so, this left us with what we still have today is our hours, which are based on six and twelve and twenty-four hours a day. There's a reason for that, and minutes, sixty seconds in a minute, sixty minutes in one of those hours, declinating, broken out into those sections rather than based on tens necessarily, but twelve, which is the sacred number, from Christ's disciples to a lot of things and the zodiac. But also, they declinated the world to be round and have 360 degrees around it, calling it a circle. And they noticed that the sun fell what would be one degree if you had based it on 360, one degree per day as it falls through what is fall or autumn to us now from being at peak summer. And as it falls lower and lower in the sky, it ends up getting real close to, a, depending on where you are, a constellation called the Southern Cross. And it set there for three days during our wobble it almost looks like it doesn't go lower and it doesn't come up it's what's gonna happen and three days later it starts to rise again one degree per day and so on now it does so all the way until Easter and it continues to go up from there but the key point of Easter is an equinox point for through the death of winter we've been seeing more darkness than we have light and it's more and more evident the farther you get away from the equator in the northern hemisphere where all this comes from and so an ancient story is told that the son of god dies on a cross and three days later symbolically rises to save all mankind from the death of winter or another ice age and this has been passed down at least since the last ice age but we find it in these stories and this symbolic turning of the seasons and the wheel in the sky that keeps going the circle of life if you will now according to some scholars such as dr. Tony Nugent teacher of theology and religious studies at Seattle University and Presbyterian minister the Easter story comes from the Sumerian legend of Damuzi, or Tammuz as you know him in the Bible, and his wife, Inanna, Ishtar, an epic myth called the Descent of Inanna, found inscribed on cuneiform clay tablets dating back to 2100 BC, and I'm telling you there are tablets that date back farther than that, and when they start, they tell you this is an ancient story. This happened long, long ago. When Tammuz dies, Ishtar is grief stricken and follows him to the underworld in that underworld she enters through seven gates and her worldly attire is removed each gate they ask her to remove some of her stuff naked and bowed low she is judged then killed and then hung on display in her absence the earth loses its fertility crops cease to grow and animals stop reproducing it's kind of a gruesome tale 
unless something is done all life on earth will end and this is a weird epic here but I'm telling you that Tammuz is the story in the Bible uh, mentioned too where the ladies are wailing for Tammuz so there used to be a wailing that went on and they would dress up and adorn a god and bring him out and people would speak to him in early Christianity too and as if he was there and stuff and it would bring forth life they were pretty much making a golem out of this statue in some form or fashion and uh, there's a few different rites that went along with this concept but it also shows you a person pretty much being dead deceased hung on display in other words like up on a meat rack thing and that's the way they kind of explain it but in this time here it's more of an idea where you let the birds take the flesh away and take it up to the sky right and there's your story and Inanna shows with wings quite often and she has the wisdom of how and of immortality for she perpetuated not in one lifetime but in many over and over again you know kind of kind of has that spiritual mist to it but uh, after Inanna had been missing for three days there it is again her assistant goes to other gods for help finally one of them Inky Lord of the world that's what Inky means creates two creatures who carry the plant of life and water of life down to the underworld sprinkling them on Inanna and Dumuzi and it's got to do with a jackal and wolves and things and it shows you that there's a connection with that with the ancient Egyptian beliefs and the dog of the underworld and you see that dog of the underworld concept carried up into Hades and the three-headed dog of Severus and all these concepts that still are the same yet different in many cultures going from Germany to China from India to Egypt let's continue she sprinkles this on Demuzi resurrecting them and giving them the power to return to earth as the light of the Sun for six months after six months are up Tammuz returns to the underworld of the dead remaining there for another six months and Ishtar pursues him prompting the water god to rescue them both thus were the cycles of winter death and spring of life now Inky was relegated to being the god of waters and the water of life it's where the flood story comes from out of the Bible and so on it was him that told Utnapishtim to build the boat it was him that saved all mankind from the gods that felt like we were just making too much noise at one point it's it's a strange story I'll go into it in other things but uh, this idea here of the water god the cycles of spring the rains in spring and these people lived off of a river that inundated just like the Nile just like the Indus where it would spread out and cause a fertile plain to happen and so they utilize that and this is a story that goes along with that now the idea is is that when Tammuz goes away Inanna wanes and she's so sad like when a woman's man goes away in the service like my dad used to whenever he would have to go TDY and things like that and the mom would become very saddened but in the spring he returns and just in her delight flowers and butterflies spring to life birds chirp and sing and this is the symbology shown in Snow White going around singing in with the birds and doodaloo and things along that line this harkens to that same concept so let's just continue a little bit though I could keep going and going and going on that because I'm deep into Sumerians but here's a, a picture of that same situation an offset of the main altar that they run for a Christmas time and sideways and her foot is upon a lion she has conquered over Leo or in this time scale when that was coming through time and after so past this would have been something that lasted for over 2,000 years but before that would have been a symbology of before Leo you see it goes from Leo to Taurus from Taurus to Aries from Aries to Pisces where Jesus showed up where the fishers of men and the symbol that still used the fish which is actually Vesica Pisces which is a feminine symbol to now we're going back into a time of waters and uh, hey everybody's worried about the flood and global warming and oh my god but we're into Aquarius now 
the age of Aquarius. I grew up with the song when I was a kid, but uh, so we see these things. Now, Dr. Nugent is quick to point out that drawing parallels between the story of Jesus and the Epic of Inanna doesn't necessarily mean that there wasn't a real person, Jesus, who was crucified, but rather that there was the story uh, about it structured, embellished in accordance with a pattern of symbology that was very ancient and widespread. I think he just said it didn't happen right there, but we'll just continue with that. I can go through the Jesus mythology with you and so on, but what that really indicated was that he told them that he would return in a generation and it would be Armageddon for these people who could not find God that did wrong, that were subjugated under other people, Egypt, Persia, and Greece and Rome, and couldn't get their crap together. And uh, who were they? <clears throat> well, they were the people that are living around Canaan and uh, people try to separate differences between Canaanites and Phoenicians but the Phoenicians called themselves Canaan and so therefore we find a reveal there in fact the Phoenicians ancient word for the planet Saturn which some people worshiped as a god is planetary and we know that in Greek and Romans but you don't think about it in others but that Phoenician name for the planet Saturn was Israel and there's some reveals on Saturn and Saturday and what the satyrs were that they talked about and these goat gods because they were the people that grew goats and animals and things and this sustained everyone through a time of winter which we're talking about making it into spring where goats frolic and they make little baby goats and you drink goat's milk and cheese and a thyme and boy and you love to put cheese on that bread in a land of milk and honey and here we go with this whole thing let's just Let's just continue here. The Sumerian goddess Inanna is known outside of Miss Mesopotamia, though, by her Babylonian name, which is different than the Sumerians, Ishtar. And people have seen Ishtar, and there's an old movie, Ishtar, when I was growing up as a kid and stuff. It's funny how these things just keep enveloping together, but of course it would. In ancient Canaan, Ishtar is known as Astarte, so you have these star parts to the name. And her counterparts in the Greek and Roman pantheons are known as Aphrodite and Venus. And we know the stories of Aphrodite and her sexual prowess and so on and Venus. But we also know that uh, this is a goddess of love that turned into a goddess of war. And this is the story of every single one of these because they had a dual aspect to themselves. In the 4th century when Christians identified the exact site in Jerusalem where that empty tomb of Jesus had been located, the selected spot was where a temple of Aphrodite, Astarte, Ishtar, Inanna, Diana, stood. The temple was torn down and the so church of the Holy Sepulchre was built, the holiest church in the Christian world. Dr. Nugent points out there's also the other temple and it's the temple of Baal itself. Still having the ancient symbology of that and the star of the god Rimfan and things that it talks about and that's still the Jewish star that's today but we continue. Dr. Nugent points out that the story of Inanna and Demuzi is just one of a number of accounts of a dying and rising god that represents the cycle of the seasons and the stars but that the Inanna and Demuzi one is the earliest known and they started writing and so on but it's a it's a thing that had been kept up by these people in a certain symbology for as long and much longer than crops were actually utilized. It came before that, but it became a marker. And certain areas had different inundation seasons, so they had festivals built around that, as Egypt is, is quite a bit different than most of the Northern Hemisphere ones are. And uh, even though it's still in the Northern Hemisphere to the point. Anyhow, um... For example, the resurrecting of the Egyptian god Horus, and I've told you in recent videos the Shimsu Hor and how that come from Sumerians, inundating into the people that were already primordial there of East Africa and stuff, the Caucasians that were all around North Africa and around the entire Mediterranean, the Middle Earth itself, the middle of all this kind of area and stuff. But also the story of Mithras, who was worshipped at springtime, 
and uh, a, a, a symbolic cosmic egg or a rock or a stone and this stone is quite often wrapped with a uh, snake and I'm follows and uh, showing you a circle of life situation too this is symbolically shown in a lot of places like Egypt where it's circling uh, the Sun and so on and the tales of Dionysus who is resurrected by his grandmother among these stories are prevailing themes of third, uh, fertility, conception, renewal, descent into darkness, and the triumph of light over darkness or good and evil. And why Easter becomes so important is as the darkness of winter happens, as I was referring to earlier, this is the point whenever there's more daylight than darkness and light, which is known as knowledge and life, overtakes darkness and you ride through summer. And so you have to prepare for this. And this is the whole story about the you know ants and the grasshopper and all that type of thing that's pretty much a concept that goes way back. It's the only way we made it to where we were was figuring out the seasons coming through and being able to prepare for it and know how you were going to hunt together or through it. And hopefully you'd make it through it. It was quite a hard and difficult thing. Easter is a celebration, though, of the goddess of springtime. A related perspective is that rather than being a representation of the story of Ishtar, Easter was originally a celebration of Yastre, goddess of spring, and here again with estrogen, right, and to go into estrus, goddess of spring, otherwise known as Ostera, Ostera, and Estre. And I'm telling you, that's the same thing. This is the Proto Indo European languages that catch from India to the Irish all the way through. One of the most revered aspects of Ostera for both ancient and modern observers is the spirit of renewal. Celebrated at spring equinox on March 21st, Ostera marks the day when light is equal to darkness and will continue to grow, as I said. As the beginner of light after a long dark winter, the goddess was often depicted with the hare or a rabbit, an animal that represents the arrival of spring as well as the fertility of the seasons. According to Jacob Grimm's Deutsch mythology or German mythology, the idea of resurrection was ingrained within the celebration of Ostera. Ostera Ostre seems therefore to have been the divinity of the radiant crown or upspringing light. She is the light bringer, a spectacle that brings joy and blessing whose meaning could be easily adapted by the resurrection day of the Christian God. And you might be able to see in that why the Germans really kind of saw through some parts of religion and said, no man, we've had this stuff forever. We went with our historians, and but I don't want to get into that. Um, most analysis of the origin of the word Easter agree that it has been named after Eostre with an ancient word meaning spring, although many European languages use this form or another of the Latin name for Easter, Pasha which is derived from the Hebrew Pesach, meaning Passover. And I'm telling you now that Passover had a symbol, same meaning that you were passed over through the winter in time that you had made it through that. There were difficult, difficult times. And if you made it through it, there could be a celebration. It's something that could be celebrated every year. And it became a festival for doing so. And it marked and delineated when that crap was over and people could really go hog and and uh, you know the rites of spring as you will now also they talk about it being you know Easter and all these other words what people don't get is that in the same proto indo European languages people worship the East wise men came from the East okay the Sun rises from the East and that's why these early burials were all based buried facing the east based on this concept in memorial red oak or burial facing the east giving this concept of rebirth it comes from way way before they started making up other festivals through it and as it grew through primordial people that didn't really originate it but are definitely related they brought on different aspects of the same thing now, Easter and its connections to Passover, or Biblical Passover, Easter is associated with the Jewish festival of Passover through its symbolism and meaning as well as its position of the calendar. Some early Christians choose to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus on that same date as Passover, 
which reflects Easter having entered Christianity during its earliest Jewish period. Evidence of a more developed Christian festival of Easter emerged around the mid-2nd century. Now in 325 AD, Emperor Constantine convened a meeting of Christian leaders to resolve the important disputes at the Council of Nicaea. Constantine was a Flavius. Titus was a Flavius. And these were after the Caesars, as in to give unto Caesar. And Jesus said in that generation there would be, so that's 40 years biblically. They wandered for a generation in the deserts, 40 years. Jesus died in 33 AD. What happened in 73? Well, it was the end of the Jewish revolt that had started in 66 AD on the sixth month, on the sixth day. So for those who have wisdom, count the number, for it's a human number. And it lasted seven years of trials and tribulations. That is for happening like crazy, but the people that stood fast got pretty much all taken out in a story that Josephus Flavius himself refers to as being the abomination of desolation. And there we have Armageddon, that everybody's in this death cult about to this day that really doesn't exist because in spring it comes back again and here we go. But nobody's catching on. They're all waiting for the end of the world. And I'm telling you, the end of the world will be whenever an asteroid hits us because we're stupid and don't look up. As Moses used to say, I have a stiff-necked people, O Lord. And it's that they don't understand that what they was talking about the seasons. Apparently talking to a dumb nomadic tent people at the time who didn't quite understand how it all worked with symbology of astrolo astrology and things and that a lot of this was based upon that. So, um, since the church believed that the resurrection took place on a Sunday, showing you that it's a sun god because it used to be on Saturday and that's with Saturn and the Saturnus and the most highest god for Saturn was the farthest away being able to be visible and so it was the most high god and there's a lot of that goes with Saturn and there's a lot that goes with Kronos and the god of time and all these things linked together in a common people and a common thought that all has this concept spread across it that's a web that really all connects that most people can't catch in any way shape or form and I'm trying to show that to you in my vids as I slowly pick it apart if I try to put it all together well I don't know I just did pretty good right there but if I try to show it to you it doesn't show enough data to where people have any belief in it whatsoever you pretty much have to show people all these separate people and then go okay well look at this you know and kind of put it in together this council determined though that Easter should always fall on the first Sunday after the first full moon following the vernal equinox this was the symbolic moon calendar and when it comes and it has to do with the moon, which is a feminine aspect. And so they wanted these things to go along with it. And it has to do with a full moon. And women's cycles go around a moon time. All this ancient stuff. And I've talked about it recently and so on. But Easter has since remained without a fixed date, but proximate to the full moon, which coincided with the start of Passover. And Passover was where all the Egyptians, firstborn and everything, died. But if you killed a lamb symbolically, in the time of Aries and you put it above your door frame in a symbolic shape that this was to keep the creeping death of God from killing you that he couldn't figure out whether or not you were holy or not that it would just creep through and you had to do this thing which is really why do you kill that goat well that's we're all fixing to have a big meal here and everything this is a Thanksgiving situation for, it's the Thanksgiving for making it through Christmas. There's one that we have preemptive to it now, trying to fatten this all up. People don't get this concept. While there are distinct differences between the celebrations of Peacock and Easter, both festivals celebrate rebirth, but I'm telling you, Peacock and Peacock have a lot to do with each other, and that's the Phoenix and the sign of rebirth. But that's for a whole nother video. In Christianity, though, the resurrection of Jesus and in Jewish traditions through the liberation of the Israelites from slavery that no one can find recollection of. And just to, just to ruin one other little moment of it there, the idea of the Red Sea, it uh, never says that in the old literature. It says the Reed Sea, and it's the Sea of Reeds, and it's when the Hyksos were evicted out of Egypt in a common thing where they actually used to run part of it. So it really wasn't even the 
idea they try to give across and the numbers that go with it and the things that go with it are a symbolic situation but I digress most widely practiced customs on Easter Sunday relate that the symbol of the rabbit or Easter bunny and the egg this is important too as outlined previously the rabbit was a symbol associated with Yastre representing the beginnings of springtime eggs food um, the chickens, the things that you have that are putting out these eggs, they are producing because you have been prosperous enough to give them food. And in the turn, they give you food without killing them all off to where no longer do you have food. Likewise, the egg has become to represent springtime fertility and renewal. In Germanic mythology, where a lot of this was kept sacred, including Tannenbaum, the Christmas tree, which also goes with and Nana and Demuzi coming out of the Christmas tree and these ideas. It is said the Ostera healed a wounded bird she found in the woods by changing it into a rabbit. Still partially a bird, the hare showed its gratitude to the goddess by laying eggs as gifts. In the ancient tale of Inanna, she is supposed to come back in a symbolic egg. And you're, if you find the egg, you will be praised and so on this is the idea of the Easter egg hunt and they start coloring eggs and so on the Encyclopedia Britannica clearly explains the pagan traditions associated with the egg the egg is a symbol of fertility and of renewed life it goes back to the ancient Egyptians and the Persians who together also had the custom of coloring and eating eggs during their spring festival in ancient Egypt, an egg symbolized the sun, while for the Babylonians, the egg represented the hatching of the Venus Ishtar, as I spoke of, who fell from heaven to the Euphrates each year, and they had a symbolic egg hunt that went along with it. You can see this symbolic thing where sometimes the egg is wrapped by a snake, sometimes the world is wrapped by a snake. Here you see the zodiac signs around this man. You can see this is the bringer of light, right? This is a male symbology and the same thing. He is an angel. This is Lucifer, the bad, oh my God, no. No, people have taken things way out of context. Here's Pisces. Here's the Venus symbology, Capricorn. Here we are rolling around, Taurus, Gemini. This is the symbols. This is the origin of it. So where did the tradition of an egg-toting Easter bunny come from? Well, the first reference that he tells you can be found in German text dating to 1572 AD where don't worry if the Easter bunny escapes you, should we miss his eggs, we will cook the nest, the text reads. That's funny because he's trying to say, well, there's the first. No, we've just spoken about archaic versions of the same thing, but here we have kind of an Easter bunny, I guess. Here comes Peter Cottontail hopping down the bunny trail. Hippity hoppity Easter's on its way. It wasn't until the tradition made its way to the United States via the arrival of German immigrants that the custom took on its current form we do today. By the end of the 19th century, shops were selling rabbit-shaped candies, which later became the chocolate bunnies we have today, and the children were being told the story of a rabbit that delivers baskets of eggs, chocolates, and other candy on Easter morning, and they would leave out handfuls of candy. Shortly later, we ended up having people hollowing out eggs that they had ended up getting, and they would put candies inside of them, color them up, and then go around hiding them and stuff. Later on, we would develop plastics. Now we make a shell that's really like the eggs that they used to put in legs pantyhose. You crack the thing open, you put candy in it, you put it in, one of those has something special. Usually it's a gift of gold or money, going back to the idea of if you find the egg of Inanna or Ishtar. In many Christian traditions, the custom of giving eggs at Easter celebrates new life. Christians remember that Jesus, after dying on that cross, rose from the dead, showing that he could win over from death. This is a symbolic rebirth three days later. I've spoken about twice, at least in here. For Christians, the egg is, is that symbology of the tomb in which the body of Jesus was placed, 
while cracking the egg represents Jesus' resurrection. On the Orthodox tradition, eggs are painted red to symbolize the blood of Jesus shed on the cross, but Inanna's eggs were all painted red too. Regardless of the very ancient origins of the symbol of the egg, most people agree that nothing symbolizes renewal more perfectly than the egg, round, endless, and full of the promise of life, just like a nut. While many of the pagan customs associated with the celebration of spring were once at a uh, one-stage practice alongside Christian Easter traditions, they eventually came to be absorbed within Christianity as symbols of the resurrection of Jesus. The first Council of Nicaea established the date for Easter as the first Sunday after the full moon, the Paschal full moon, following the March equinox, and Paschal has something to do with this. Whether it is observed as a religious holiday commemorating the resurrection of Jesus Christ or at a time of, for families in the Northern Hemisphere to enjoy the coming of spring and celebrate with egg decorating and Easter bunnies, the celebration of Easter still remains the same spirit of rebirth and renewal as it has for thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of years from a primordial thing all the way until today. Uh, the opening image was that of the springtime goddess. Her male counterpart is the man of spring. And this is the origins of the sacred rites of spring and Easter. Like, share, and subscribe, guys, and enjoy. I hope you enjoyed it, and uh, lots more coming soon. Peace.